spray dulu. Please take a seat. Hmm. <laughs> okay. I've got a little cubby house happening here. I'm tucked in. <laughs> I'm tucked in. Right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone, uh, at home and in the Gompa. Um, so I think, uh, well, I, I think I'm excited. I hope you're excited too. Um, <clears throat> in the sense that some of us have been on this journey for two and a half years together, of course, who knows before that, um, about, uh, you know, having this opportunity and know, um, time for celebration as well, but a few things to go through. So it's good that we're celebrating because we're going through all the pretty... Um, <clears throat> Uh, intense practices that uh, meet the requirement of fulfilling the completion of this course. However, let's just um, start first off with um, setting our motivation, thinking how wonderful that we're able to be here together in whatever way we're able to be here today, tomorrow. I think something more coming up tomorrow for uh, when Geshla joins us and we have a little celebratory lunch and so forth. <clears throat> thinking how amazing it is to have um, this precious human rebirth. I think that's become very, very obvious to us, particularly this year, you know, with um, all the challenges for the world with uh, this pandemic. And that, of course, we know because we have the opportunity that the Dharma, you know, having met a precious Mahayana Dharma, you know, fully qualified precious Mahayana gurus, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I mean, maybe we've met online, but we've met, right? Kevjay Lama Zoka Rinpoche, of course, Geshe Sutram La. 
and to be in this authentic tradition and all our other um, precious teachers, you know, having that opportunity of this precious human rebirth, having all the conducive conditions doesn't get better than this. So I must, you know, make the most of my life right now while I can, while I have whatever health I have. And some of us uh, <clears throat> feel the effects of aging. Well, we probably all feel the effects of aging. Buddha said from the time of conception, you're getting old. <laughs> we can feel it in the body. But, you know, taking this opportunity to really feel how precious this time is that we have together. And that we have had together, that we've all become Dharma buddies, Dharma friends, you know, over the past few years. And that, so we have our own community of practitioners and study reflection. So just for a moment, um, turning your attention to the breath. Now everybody's settled, I think. Just bringing your attention inwards and, and for yourself, just reflecting on this journey. Oh, first of all, just turning your attention to your breath, letting body, speech and mind settle into the space of the body. And relinquishing, releasing, any distractions, sounds. The beautiful bird sounds, letting them go, at least for those of us here. Any thoughts arising, past thoughts, future thoughts, any engagement with plans, being other places, other things. So just bringing ourselves here into the present moment, watching the breath as it goes in and out. Our breath is right here, right now. So paying attention to our breathing brings us right here, right now. Dwelling in every moment of the breath in, every moment of the breath out, really luxuriating in this breath that's keeping us alive. And whenever a distraction arises, simply be aware, release it, relinquish it, let go of the energy around that, and bringing your attention back to your breath again and again. Something you're familiar with doing already. And as we've gone on this journey of familiarizing more and more with the Buddha's teachings, we know the qualities of the Buddha to some extent, the qualities of the teachings to some extent, the Arya Sangha to some extent, thinking that the Buddha didn't distinguish. You know, we see that demonstrated at the time of the Buddha's life in um, India you know, completely taught impartially for all beings. And because manifesting in a human form for the benefit of humans, then the Buddha, you know, taught anyone from any caste, gender, whatever, you know, no partiality. The Buddha holds us in even regard, equally compassionate to all beings, not just the humans, 
or being seen, unseen in all realms of existence simultaneously holding in their heart, wishing to benefit. So following in the footsteps of the Buddha, we can generate a motivation thinking how nice it would be if everyone could be happy, not just the temporal happiness of the sense pleasures of this life, of this body, but the ultimate happiness of the mind by knowing, familiarizing with the causes of true happiness, cultivating those, and to be free from suffering, even to know it is possible to be free from the causes of suffering, all the neurotic, deluded states of mind, the afflictions that poison our minds. And on the basis of some understanding of karma, and we can have compassion for those who have none of that understanding whatsoever, just helplessly thrown life to life as we have been too from beginningless time. From one suffering existence to the other, not bearing to see that generating a strong sense of responsibility, the special responsibility to do whatever we can to benefit others, to bring about whatever we can to help them have happiness and less suffering. And being the courageous bodhisattva thinking, I will do all this by myself alone. So here we are right here, right now, learning about the teachings, continuing to learn about the teachings of the Buddha and how to recognize, to cultivate our own innate Buddha nature. Which every being, every mind possessor has, even the cockroaches and the ants and the little flies around here. Think about that when the march flies are bugging you, bugging me. <laughs> They're out and about right now. <laughs> they too have Buddha nature. You know, so to benefit others as skillfully as possible. And at least learning, putting into practice how not to make problems or suffering for others. At least, if we can't benefit, as the Buddha said, don't harm them. Okay, so having set that altruistic motivation, we will look at our um, outline for this journey over this weekend. So, um, Geshe Sultram uh, will be has accepted our request to join us tomorrow morning. Uh, so Geshe-la will be joining us at 10.30 a.m. So I might just slightly rejig the morning, um, maybe tomorrow morning. And for those online planning, um, we'll go from maybe 9 to 10 and then have a break. And then geshe -la comes at 10.30 and then we finish at 12 because we have to prepare a great big feast apparently. Um, and some of the Sangha are joining us, so getting a sense of how many today. I mean, some have accepted, so, I mean, we'll be here. Of course, they all want to come, but whether they're here or not. Um, so anyway, um, we seem to have learned the bounteousness of generosity of offering. So it's very nice. I know there's been some plans afoot. So I think tomorrow there's going to be a few things to celebrate. Of course, every moment we're alive, there's a few things to celebrate. So in the meantime, I guess we're going to go through um, uh, just to familiarise a bit more. I mean, we can all read and know um, what the practices, the special integration practices. So um, for uh, discovering Buddhism, 
Um, and these were advised by Lama Zopa Rinpoche uh, for those wishing to get the highest benefit from this program, right? So they are regarded as um, foundation practices to purify, clear away negative karma. To make the most of this life, prepare us in the best possible way for a peaceful death and a good future rebirth. And of course, the ultimate happiness of liberation and enlightenment, if not this lifetime, as swiftly as possible. And I think our, our, all we, we've, we've had all these tools, you know, put into our toolkit over this period together. You know, each module has gone through a topic of the Lamb Rim, the graduated path to enlightenment. And then we've had um, how to study that, reflect on that, meditate on that. So it's this, this course, an amazing structure that basically is a foundation, gives everything you need, right? So it's so precious, you know. Often when, um, you know, older students and even some teachers, some elders uh, hear about um, just what the uh, requirements are of this module and for the completion, you know, get a bit of, it's like, oh gosh, that's pretty heavy duty. Well, it is if we look at it as a conventional sense. And so, but it's not just about, um, it's not just about, you know, doing numbers and getting a certificate. And uh, of course, what Rinpoche is giving us the opportunity for is on the basis of understanding karma. That's really what it's about. Practices to purify our mind and accumulate, you know, as much merit as we can to practice the two accumulation so that we can, um, of merit and wisdom, so that, uh, you know, we can attain this state of enlightenment that we talk about that we want, right? So, um, yeah, if, so we, we really need to think about this in the context of karma, isn't it? And if we understand that, um, that comes to the real purpose of doing these practices. Right? So if we understand, good morning, Graham. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> You're here. We rejoice. So really, Rinpoche has given this, us a gift for our spiritual development by giving us these practices, you know, to the accumulation of merit. Lama, yes, she said, is like jet fuel, fuel for enlightenment. But if we don't have that fuel, we know we turn on the engine. We're not going anywhere, are we? If there's no what, petrol in the tank. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so... Um, we're, we're going to go through the different um, uh, practices and requirements for this module. But, you know, first of all, setting the ground that we rely on as we set our motivation at the beginning, the ground of refuge, the reliance. So later on, we'll go more in depth in the four opponent powers, refreshing on those. However, you know, we think about the refuge, the ground to stand on. So towards the end of his life, when um, Ananda asked the Buddha, you know, what are we going to do? You know, how are the teachings going to continue? The Buddha replied, now I am old, Ananda, aged, burdened with years, advanced in life, come to the last stage. I mean, I guess 
some of us were watching His Holiness the Dalai Lama on Thursday for Lama Song Kappa Day, praise of dependent arising, where he, he mentioned how it had been past predicted uh, by one past Lama, his, uh, his um, living to 113. And he said, oh, well, I've, you know, he's pretty confident of living to 110 at this point. Well, that's a confidence probably we don't share, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> and not with such a gorgeous body. Um, I don't know, His Holiness, if we want an example of what seems to be the fountain of youthfulness, His Holiness seems to be getting younger and younger, <laughs> glowing. And I think the fact of not doing all that international travel has been very beneficial. As he says, I only have to go from there to here. And Rinpoche as well. And Rinpoche as well. Rinpoche 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 radiant and so... Anyway, Shakyamuni Buddha says, just as an old cart keeps going by a combination of straps, so it seems the body of the Tathagata keeps going by a combination of straps. Therefore, Ananda, dwell with yourself as your own island, with yourselves as your own refuge, with no other refuge. Dwell with the Dharma as your island, with the Dharma as your refuge, with no other refuge. So we know that, yes, the Buddha taught, and we recite, you know, this refuge prayer. The real refuge is, you know, not just reciting the prayer, but understanding what it means to take refuge, what these three um, objects of refuge three rare sublime ones, as Kepje Lama Zopa um, prefers to, to translate, three rare sublime ones, you know, what those qualities are, but particularly the Dharma jaw, the own realizations in our own mind. And we can only do that by ourselves doing the hard yards, basically. <laughs> And how does Ananda, does a monk dwell with himself as his own island, with himself as his own refuge, with no other refuge, with the Dharma as his island, with the Dharma as his refuge, with no other refuge? Here, Ananda, a monk dwells contemplating the body in the body, ardent, clearly comprehending, mindful, having removed covetousness and displeasure in regard to the world, so the three poisons, he dwells contemplating feelings in feelings, mind in mind, phenomena in phenomena. So there we have the four close applications of mindfulness, ardent, clearly comprehending, mindful, having removed covetousness and displeasure in regard to the world attachment and aversion, grasping and hatred. Check up. Okay, where it says island, there's a note, the Indian word for island, Deepa, when we offer the light, you know, you'll see the Sanskrit, um, uh, we, some, we say allocate, but in also in some of the um, offerings, it's deeper. So we can say a lamp. In other words, be a lamp unto yourself. And so there we see how a tisha, be a lamp unto yourself, the lamp of enlightenment, the stage of the path to enlightenment. The ground or basis we can rely on is presented in Buddhism as going for refuge, not just reciting, but really in our hearts, contemplating understanding what it means and how we are doing that in actuality. So there's different ways of understanding refuge and the objects we go for refuge, the teachings. So the Buddha, the Dharma, Sangha, the community of practitioners. And when we talk about the community of practitioners, we're talking about those great, you know, sort of realized beings, Arya beings, our precious gurus, our precious teachers, which we also say synonymous with the Buddha, um, that we have, you know, the commentaries on the teachings of the Buddha and so forth. I remember somebody one time saying, I can't go for refuge 
within my you know community of ordinary lay people, which is a lay, per, lay woman, um, I can't go for refuge in those. We do say the relative sama, sangha, ordinary monks and nuns, represent, you know, remind us, rep, they remind us of something spiritual within ourselves, isn't it? Okay. So what are the, some of the ways that enable us to find or deepen our refuge? By establishing refuge in our heart, we create the ground upon which all activities, such as, such as study, meditation, reflection, meditation, working, offering service, daily living, and so forth, become part of our spiritual path. So basically, everything we do, right, becomes part of our spiritual path. It's a bit, um, what, what could we say? Oh, now I'm doing these practices and now I'm getting on with Christmas shopping. I mean, the thing I like about Christmas, I mean, this is why Lama Song Cup Day is great. Everyone thinks you're putting up your Christmas lights and you just leave the lights up and I'm a hong, I'm a hong, I'm a hong. And everyone else's lights, I'm a hong, I'm a hong, I'm a hong. You offer everything and just think how wonderful the light of wisdom is shining in the world. I mean, if we look at it at a conventional center, we say, no, nah, they're just trying to sell you something. But, you know. We can transform all of that as we were looking last time, last module. Okay. And during challenging times, that phrase must have been used so many times this year, huh? we can come back and touch base with this ground and get back on our feet and keep going. I think for all of us here, we've had that not only opportunity to do that in our hearts, but we've managed to have the teachings keep going through this difficult time. And actually, as we were saying about His Holiness and Lama Zopa Rinpoche, they have a convenience of um, just, you know, we have the convenience of being able to connect with them online whenever. <coughs> you know, it's wonderful. So precious, all our precious teachers and teachings, we can't keep up with it all. So in the refuge prayer, I go for refuge until I'm enlightened Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, and the Supreme Assembly. We all know that. And then we set our altruistic motivation. So this is, you know, the big, all our practices that we're going to engage in. This is our first step, isn't it? Our step of reliance. And then the second part of reliance is the altruistic motivation, isn't it? The other ground on which we rely on is sentient beings, isn't it? And so that it's on the basis of other sentient beings that we become enlightened, as we have talked about many times. So setting our direction, our altruistic motivation, particularly having engaged in um, the presentation of the Lam Rim by the Mahayana presentation of the graduated path to enlightenment, it sort of like comes with the package some of us have taken the bodhisattva vows as well so we have absolutely made that commitment for all to benefit sentient beings up until enlightenment you know the next important question where do we want to go in which direction would we like our life to move towards i mean we can also think about that what where we want to go in terms of post this course this is about our motivation, our purpose in life. And I think, you know, we've all had ample opportunity to discuss these aspects. Once It's like once you've met the Dharma, there's no going back, is there? There's no unmeeting the Dharma. There's always the, even we, um, you know, stray away and beat ourselves up for, oh, you know, um, oh, I'm not, I'm not practicing well enough. We should be doing the opposite, you know, you know, sort of, wow, we've met the Dharma. And so what do we want to do with our lives moving forward? What's our motivation, our purpose in our life? And I think we've all got a very clear understanding of that, right? I'm assuming we have. Um, so in Tibetan Buddhism, of course, the highest motivation, bodhicitta, the altruistic motivation, to work towards enlightenment to benefit all sentient beings. So this is expressed in the four immeasurable thoughts. So these all, you know, we have all these practices. We're all familiar with these practices. Cultivating the immeasurable mind of loving concern for others, you know, 
regarding others as, as we would regard our dearest friends. As His Holiness says, I, I, I meet everybody as an old friend. I regard everyone as an old friend, every being as an old friend, cultivating that sense of closeness, seeing them as attractive. And then the compassion and not bearing to see the suffering. So all we have to do is watch the news for that. Maybe we don't even have to watch the news. Maybe we've got enough of that happening around us on every, at every moment, you know. But that on the basis of that compassion, the, 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 the highest motivation of bodhicitta, first of all, then great compassion, extending that out from family, friends to all beings, and the bodhicitta motivation that says, I will become a Buddha, as we've just said in the refuge bodhicitta prayer, you know. And then immeasurable joy, joyfulness of wishing all beings to have ultimate happiness of enlightenment, not just the temporary sensory pleasures or worldly concerns, you know, status, reputation, looking good, getting what you want, getting stuff. And all of that based on the mind of equanimity regarding all beings as equal. And I find that also the news really good for that, isn't it? Um, isn't it? Because you hear about, you know, all the conflicts in the world and you think they're all suffering sentient beings. They're all, you know, everyone's trying to get what they want. Um, and the tendency of the mind to take sides is strong. But to think, no, regardless of opinion, regardless of political views or whatever, all these beings are wanting happiness. So like that. Okay. So then by my practice of giving and other perfections, her second half of the refuge prayer, the bodhicitta one, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And isn't it wonderful? Now we know what all those lines mean because we've studied, isn't it? We've got a deeper meaning. And we continue to deepen that. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. So the third noble truth and the fourth noble truth. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering, the first noble truth, second noble truth. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering, also the third noble truth. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity free of attachment and anger that holds some close and others distant. So we have to start with ourselves. We say may all sentient beings, but we can say may I. <laughs> start with ourselves. So, um, so then, you know, it is good to spend some time, maybe on a daily basis, contemplating what is my highest aspiration for others? How can I benefit others today? taking baby bodhisattva steps forward. What is it I can do today to be a benefit others? It immediately, as soon as you get up, get, get up out of bed or wake up, turns your mind to others and gets us out of our own self-absorption. And then, of course, we have to do that repeatedly throughout the day. Oh, that's right. And um, we were asked, Geshe-la asked um, the Sangha to come on Thursday night for, geshe Nomi has a general teaching on Thursday night. Some, some of you were here, yes. It being Lama Tsongkhapa Day, geshe -la requested the Sangha to come um, and it was to be a Q&A session, which geshe -la said Q&A with Sangha, not just with geshe -la. I think it was geshe -la's Q and Q&A of the Sangha. <laughs> But um, which we don't often, I guess I wanted us all to talk about, um, you know, what ordination means for us or why we ordained or something like that, and then ask us all a question, which was really good because it made my mind think more. Um, as uh, Leonie said yesterday, um, or was it Leon? Yeah, you said it seemed like the question was pertinent to each one. You know, he asked a question. Yeah. But, it wasn't stock, it was, everyone had different questions. So 
it got us thinking because we don't normally talk about ourselves like that. <laughs> Maybe I do more than others because, you know, I give examples when I'm teaching. So, But it made me think, you know, when I first was preparing for ordination, that um, a senior nun said, you know, because I was thinking, well, down the track sometime, <laughs> you know, far distant future, thinking I had a far distant future, which can be a danger for all of us, isn't it? Um, and she said, you don't all want to wait till you're too old to be of benefit, like the Buddha saying, you know, I've got an old body now. <laughs> the cart's falling apart. <laughs> and so it, it really brought me out of my own self-absorption of, oh, you mean it's not about me getting all day? <laughs> it's actually about others. Gonna be young shin. I also repeated it to the nuns who ordained during this very year in lockdown. No, he ordained last year, Gompola. <laughs> yeah. It also does, like you say, go, oh, come on, maybe soon rather than later. Maybe sooner rather than later. Yes, it made me think that. And then when, when, uh, I guess she Sampton said, and, and when Rinpoche comes, he'll ordain you. It was sooner than later. Because <laughs> Rinpoche also said. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So thinking about, you know, continuing on my spiritual journey, having a good foundation from this course and so forth and from our studies, from our meditation and so forth, how am I going to continue on? How do I want to keep this spiritual journey alive? And I think this brings us back to these um, special integrated integration experiences. I think I, I, I sort of call it integration practices, but actually Rinpoche calls them integration experiences because the whole point is the experience, gaining that experience. Okay. So we have these opportunities for these experiences. Um, so just we'll, you know, we'll go through topics, but um, so the Lam Rim um, course, 100,000 Vajrasafa, 100,000 prostrations, three Nyungnes. Okay, so uh, then we're going to go through all that. And um, with all the... Uh, the, you know, the material that you get for this is basically what what I found wonderful was that um, FPMT this year has put all of that online so that all you can even join the discussion group for when I'm doing prostrations, what if this blah, 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 you know, frequently asked questions. So it's all online there. So you can access the FAQs for um, discovering Buddhism 14 um, and also uh, the lamb I think I sent the links for the various things and for they've also put up a lamb rim um, a dedicated page as well I remember years and years ago there used to be um, I don't know who managed that it was some I think it was Kendall anyway there was a within FBMT there was a lamb rim email group it was before all this material was put together and you'd get these daily emails it was a chat group lamb rim chat group it was I just like absorbed myself in that daily and uh it was really wonderful you felt like you got to know people very intimately even though you'd never met them except a name on email because <laughs> there were some very frequent responders Anyway, we can talk about that sort of thing. But the required readings, um, now, uh, all of those, the required readings, suggested readings, um, they're all about practice, right, and how to do this. So they're all in the library. All of them are in the library. Some are multiple copies. So even when we get to the prostrations, you know, the... Um, mm, The one, Brian Beresford, that's the one, isn't it? 
professional downfalls compared yeah, this one the blue book this one it's a rare and precious item when i say it's in the library it's currently in my possession <laughs> there's only one copy but it'll go back down there um yes subsequently probably this afternoon all right, so you've got all the list of readings and so forth, and you all know about how to read, don't need to. So we're coming back to looking at, um, so a big focus on purification practices. So purifying our life through ethics. So this is our job. Um, we've been introduced to a number of purification practices and there's quite a few. So the purpose of that, um, as the Buddha said, for one who is virtuous bhikkhus, so he says bhikkhus, which is fully ordained monks, gaylongs, because that's who he was specifically addressing, but we can take that to mean all of us. But you could also think that ones who become ordained have made that commitment. So it's like, there's no other question. But I think, you know, those are anyone who's taken refuge has made that commitment. So for one who is virtuous because endowed with virtue, no deliberate volition need to be exerted. Let freedom from remorse arise in me. This is the natural law because that freedom from remorse arises in one who is virtuous endowed with virtue so remorse regret so again we'll go through the four opponent powers a bit more later in a bit more detail but freedom from remorse arise in one who is in virtuous endowed with virtue in other words i think it's a promise of things to come well for me it is <laughs> to work towards but that the more we engage in virtue, even we can say to the extent that already we can see this, the more I engage in virtue, the more I see there's less I have to atone for, make amends for, go, okay, now I really need to purify that, right? Because we're attuning our mind to be more in sync with reality, with, with virtue, with the practice of virtue. So for one who is free from remorse, no deliberate, volition needs to be exerted although when we look at the six perfections in the meantime we need to exert a hell of a lot you know we've been looking at that in bodhisattva's way of life with the joyous effort enthusiasm and so forth and it just goes on and on and on cutting down all our lazinesses of mind all our negative self-doubt and um, distractions and procrastinations and habituation to the negative which is the hardest thing isn't it so the only thing only way we can change that is habituate to the opposite let freedom from remorse arise in me so we can say that we can add that to our motivations the gladness arises in one free from remorse that gladness arises and you can see this is a journey and on top of that, rapture um, arises in one who is gladdened. That for one filled with rapture, the body becomes tranquil. The body becomes tranquil. Oh, way to go. Perhaps we've, from moment to moment in a meditation, gone, and then it's fleetingly or maybe you're better meditator than me and it's been more than a fleeting moment um but you know we did look at that with the nine stages of meditation not only tranquil you get to the point where you know lightness of being pliancy of body and mind tranquil that one tranquil in the body and we also looked at that with the guru devotion you know relate at, looking at the marks of a teacher who's completely pacified, their body, speech, and mind completely pacified. So Geshe told us as Sangha one time, don't go flaying your arms around because you disturb the insects and others, you know, containing. It makes you mindful, right? If 
for someone like me who flays my arms. I'm going to push them down. <laughs> that one who is blissful, the mind becomes concentrated. So this power of, of bliss. Also, they said, you know, the bliss experience when one has a realization of emptiness. Even So even one moment of a sort of non-conceptual mind, we can get that sense, right, of feels good. And then we grasp at it, so then we undo it. <laughs> but, you know, we are works in progress. The mind becomes concentrated. That one who is concentrated knows and sees things as they truly are. So this is using... Um, shamatha, calm abiding and special insight, combining those, you know, to realize wisdom. That one knowing and seeing things as they really are becomes disenchanted. In other words, not interested in worldly activities. Disenchanted, weary with samsara weary with this cycling life do i have to keep doing this again as it says in the sangata sutra are you done coming to jambudvipa jambudvipa is our continent southern continent you had enough of this already <laughs> so that mind <clears throat> and dispassionate that one who is disenchanted and dispassionate realizes the knowledge knowledge and vision of deliverance in other words this is how we get liberated. Thus, bhikshus, one stage flows into the other succeeding stage. One stage comes to fulfillment in the succeeding stage for crossing over from the hither shore to the beyond. So the epithet for Buddha, the thus gone beyond, one gone beyond, gone beyond what? The suffering of samsara, one liberated from the suffering of samsara. Okay. So, <clears throat> ethical discipline. Taught by the Buddha as the foundation upon which we can develop quality. So another way, this is another, the foundation on which we rely. If we look at the, all the practices of the small scope is about ethical discipline, isn't it? You know, we practice abstaining from the 10 non-virtues and engaging in virtue. That's what we're talking about. Ethical discipline, the foundation upon which we develop the qualities of concentration and wisdom, the culmination of the spiritual path for enlightened one naturally and spontaneously acts in an ethical way. So this is why we need the purification for this. Hmm? Yeah. Graham, did you get the notes? No. It's in the notes, but I'll read again. Culmination of the spiritual path. Yeah, I think I didn't send to you. You didn't respond. That's why I didn't send to you. I didn't want to bug people. It's all right. No, no, he didn't. He didn't get it because he didn't um, register. With... He managed to move his boat, and so thank you, Graham. He managed to be here. He wasn't going to be here, right? So he got here. He moved his boat to the other shore. And found better weather, see? Best, perfect, yeah. Okay. Okay, so ethical discipline is taught by the Buddha to be the foundation upon which we can develop the qualities of concentration and wisdom. So these are the three principles of the path. Ethics, concentration and wisdom. It's the culmination of the spiritual path for an enlightened one naturally and spontaneously acts in an ethical way. Naturally and spontaneously. Can we see examples in our lives of that? I mean, of course, I always think his all in the slums of a Rinpoche. Geshe-la. Anyone someone doing it in some little way. It's all good. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. The more we do and recognises that. Yeah. 
So it's the main cause for a good rebirth. We've, we've looked at all this in the three scopes. Uh, rebirth in the upper realms while caught in samsara. And it's on the basis of knowing, again, reflecting back to this precious human rebirth that we have all the conducive conditions. We have the best conditions. Just like we've got the best conditions here in Queensland, it would seem during this year, having not experienced a very traumatic experience of COVID outbreaks. And then as we went into lockdown here at Chen Rizik, I thought, well, we've actually got the best conditions in the Sunshine Coast because we're in this retreat setting. Really wonderful, except for Sonia. She probably had the best down there. I don't know. You had pretty good conditions too, right? Because <laughs> you know, you're just outside the gate. <laughs> okay. Ethics easily leads to a sense of joy and gladness, knowing that one's life has been lived in accordance with one's conscious and ethical discipline principles. So, I mean, we can maybe think about that. And I was thinking about that when Geshla asked me a question about, you know, not talking about spiritual, but how can you make the most of your life? And I thought, well, I've always had a very strong social justice um, drive, motivation. And I, I remember, you know, obviously pre-ordination, but working in an aid agency and, and feeling so joyous about having that job because you feel like every morning, every day, what you're doing is being of benefit to others, you know? And so whatever we choose as a profession that's of benefit to others, or have chosen for us, <clears throat> even more so as Sangha, right? Okay. So ethics confers a sense of freedom from remorse and regret because one has restrained oneself, not acting under the influence of our afflictions and causing harm to others. Practice of ethics, two perspectives, looking back at our past, purifying past misdeeds, we're, we're familiar with this. We have had the teachings of ka on karma. So we have some understanding about um, the urgency of the need to purify these imprints on our mind stream, the negative um, seeds on our mind, knowing that if we don't, they're only going to multiply, fester, grow and be harder and cause us if we don't purify, to end up in more tormented states of existence again and again and again. And do we want that? Nope. Do we want that for others? Nope. Not at all. So we look into the present. We see how am I living my life now? You know, we check up on a daily basis in terms of cultivating mindfulness but also cultivating virtue and refraining as much as we can from non-virtue because we know the consequences and that's very hard knowing the consequences because consequences don't come in this life I mean we see some very immediate consequences that's true and of our you know bad actions and bad speech but the real consequences are the tenacious imprints on our mind stream, which is why we have to do these intensive purification practices while we can. <clears throat> and then we look to the future and say, think about future rebirths, or my intent is to become a Buddha. So the only way I can do that is engage in virtue, amass the accumulations, the six perfections and so forth. Isn't it? Okay, so that's our grounding. That's the ground on, on which we're engaging in these practices. So then we have um, the practices of purification that Rinpoche has given us to do. I mean, there are many, good morning, Florin. There are many, many, um, 
non-dro or they're called preliminary practices. It is a whole body of practices within all the Tibetan traditions. Um, and different traditions might emphasize different ones. For this course, Rinpoche is emphasizing the practice of the 100,000 prostrations and the 100,000 Vajrasattva mantras as those um, particular Nyondo practices. And it said that um, they are practices that uh, are very powerful to chip away at that sort of gross level of our afflictions. So we, you know, we're familiar with the analogy of scrubbing, 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 that, you know, the, the, the easy ones that we can just like shaking out a cloth, I wish. <laughs> I think we've done those already, no, I'm not sure, but I, we need those on a daily basis, actually we need those on a daily basis <laughs> as well. And then others need the sort of heavy duty soaking agents and, you know, the scrubbing, 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 or the, as we were in the three month Vajrasafa retreat last, last year, and hopefully we do again towards the end of next year. We're planning to do that. Um, is, um, you know, the washing machine on churn cycle, I think, you know, we're heavy duty churn cycle for the, what are they, heavy duty soiled clothing or something. Anyway, we've got to chip away or, you know, use strong measures. And that's why these practices are so sound, so overwhelming. And the thing that makes it um, fully qualified is applying the four opponent powers, powers. So it makes it fully qualified, fully powerful, uh, fully effective to, uh, to be a complete purification practice. And again, we are so fortunate that we've been presented how to, uh, you know, that we have these presentation of the practices within FPMT of uh, these practices incorporate already, if we just read <laughs> the book, and they incorporate the four opponent powers right there. You know, so they're, they're right there in front of us. So we know the four opponent powers, power of regret, power of reliance, power of remedy, and power of restraint. So we could just um, go through those a little bit more uh, refreshing. So I think everyone has some familiarity with these, right? I don't think anybody's hearing this for the first time. <clears throat> So it's always made the distinction, the power of regret um, is not, the, not guilt. Having been brought up in a Christian background, I think I've sort of familiarised with the guilt factor pretty early on. <laughs> yeah, the old, yeah, mea culpa thing, yes, with the whip, yeah, exactly. Anyway, no, we don't do self-flagellation, so... Uh, we do enough of that already, putting ourselves down, beating ourselves up, isn't it? And that is seen, it's presented as a form of laziness. So this, it's a, it's a sort of laziness of um, despondency or self-doubt or dis discouragement of ourselves. It, it's, I didn't get that. Could you try again? Thanks, Siri. <laughs> Siri. It's an excuse, isn't it? Um, blaming yourself, you know, saying that you're stupid. It's sort of like an excuse why you, why you, you know, you can then be lazy because you're stupid. You, know, you just keep. Oh, I can't do it, so I won't even yeah. start. That's right. You just keep dumping on yourself and just yeah. giving yourself excuses why you don't do it. Yeah. I was like one of the prisoners who said, I tried meditation once, it didn't work. Five minutes, I said, How long did you try? Five minutes. And so it's like you've said to yourself, oh, it doesn't work. It's a laziness of mind to say it doesn't work rather than say, oh, actually, I haven't worked it myself. You know, I haven't put it into action. And it does take a lot. We have the opportunity as a, the Dharma Jewels because there's support, you know. We support each other and 
as Lama Yeshi says, best to do. He says, where people are successful, particularly with Vajrasattva, so, is that you do in a group retreat, because Westerners, he said specifically Westerners, better in re doing together. We know that um, when we come to teachings or do, you know, the retreat weekends or come to retreats together, that there is a power in that in your practice. And so that helps us because we support each other in that. So it's just tried and true, isn't it, really? So the regret, the power of regret. So some texts put the power of um, reliance first. So I think um, just seeing where budget suffer is in here. Oh, it just turned to the page. This is very handy. And look, I got a little cheat sheet mantra in my book. Anyone got one in this? The silver book. Right on the page of Vajrasafa, it's been put together, the mantra, and then the meaning of the mantra at the back. It's so wonderful. Okay. If anyone would like this, it's yours. Anyone would like this? Sure. Fine. There you go. I think Thanks. when we do the end of year Vajrasafa retreat, that, that comes. Um, yes, so if you see page 202, this one starts with the power, well, it says power of dependence, which is reliance. So it starts with the first half of that there and then the power of regret. So what I'm saying is you'll see, um, you'll see these presented in different order. So sometimes the power of reliance first, sometimes the power of regret first. But the thing about the power of regret coming first is we notice that we've done something and generate the mind of regret. It's sort of how we process things, isn't it? it is like, oh, I've stuffed up. Not I've stuffed up, I'm a bad person. I've stuffed up, what can I do? So we generate this mind of regret because we recognize that certain actions that we've done have indeed done harm or, you know, they've harmed others, they've harmed ourselves when we've made this commitment not to do that. And because we have an understanding of karma, karma multiplies, and then we know the karma of the environmental result, we know the karma of the, um, well, we don't know, as the Buddha said, all the ins and outs of karma, but we know that we have the result of experiences similar to the cause where we experience that thing over and over again, or the result similar to the cause where we do that thing over and over again, habituated like smoking, you know, you know, like you have one and then you have another one and then you have another one. And unless you have a heavy quit smoking program, you keep having more and more and it gets harder and harder to give up. And in the meantime, the consequences come. So that's just this body, let alone what's happening to the mind. So here we're looking at the mind, of course. They bring problems later. And we recognize that this was being selfish. What happened to my bodhicitta motivation? And it's not beating ourselves up. This is not the beat yourself up thing. So yes, I made a mistake. I was deluded. I was out of my mind. So guilt is more based on this sense of, as one of the prisoners said, I'm a bad person. You know, how can, can I be a good person in this life? That was a tragic question to hear in my ears, you know. Of course, even in the next moment, that was too much for him to conceptualise because he'd always been told he was a bad person. So this is already a wrong view of I have this permanent unchanging bad person or unable to purify person or stupid person or whatever things we take on board based on this mistaken view of self right so it's not that 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 will lead us to guilt what leads us to regret is looking at um what we've done wrong and knowing that there's a way to purify it and 
with our understanding of karma, one having a sense of urgency to do that quickly. Okay, so there's no positive result from feeling guilty and only just brings us down more and more, makes us miserable. And that blocks our spiritual development. We disempower ourselves in that process, isn't it? So regret is, is based on wisdom. It's a constructive, it's an action step. It's based on understanding the consequences. And, you know, when we're looking at the karma module of different things, so the consequences of killing would be that environmental karma. You'd be in a reborn in a place where, you know, your life is short or likely to be short in a condition where your life, you know, it may be in a war zone or you may be in an animal body where animals have each other for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you know, something like that. Or, or humans have you for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, actually. That as well. Uh, <clears throat> or you uh, um, have the, you know, experiences similar to the cause of killing again and again. Or you experience, you know, uh, chronic illness and so forth, or medicines aren't effective for you. You know, things that are supposed to nourish your body, poison you, all sorts of things like that. So by knowing that sort of consequences, this, the end, having this altruistic motivation, the thought of having harm to others disturbs our minds. I can't bear the thought that I've harmed another being, right? It's, I'm going against my motivation, my true nature, my Buddha nature. Even when we don't think Buddha nature, you know, it's just like, this is not who I am. You know, this is not a, who I want to be. Okay. So, you know, in the Vajrasattva practice, it talks about it as um, generating a mind that has an urgency of if you've taken a poison, this is the analogy the Buddha used, that you just, you wouldn't be, you know, going to the therapy for analysis of why you're like this. I mean, that may be useful, right? <clears throat> but in the first instance, to purify what you have done, <clears throat> you just want the poison out. You want to purify it as swiftly as possible. So, and then the stronger that power of regret, the better, isn't it? Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> so these four opponent powers are mental states that we're developing. In fact, there is, you know, if we look at the mental factors, which way back, mind and its potential, we look at, um, you know, way back June 2018. <laughs> it all makes more sense now, right? I think we were having that conversation yesterday, Ingrid, and Ingrid saying, yeah, that that really, I want to study that one again. It makes more sense to me now. It is big. It is big, you know. Um, it took me a while to, to understand why on earth do we do that module first? <laughs> you probably had that at Copan as well, right? Yeah, I think. Anyway. Yeah, there was a lot going on, right? <laughs> session but you know yeah. the whole lot the whole lot every session yeah absolutely okay so um yeah so this mind of regret so it is a mental factor so it it's one of those um called changeable mental factors it, it's neither virtuous nor non-virtuous but could be either so say you make a an amazing offering to, let's say, a Nalanda master's garden statue, which is, I, I'm not sure if this, anyway, we seem to be generating more and more statues. Do you know our latest, our latest offering, some kind benefactor has offered to all the centers and we, we, we've accepted for the nuns community and for Chen Rezi both offered. A Shitigaba statue, a 
kind benefactor is offered to all the everyone. Isn't that amazing? Wow. And so, yeah, that one just came along into the mix. It's going, yes, here, out here. City Garba out here. Oh, next year. Next year. <laughs> next year, City Garba's coming here. And then we're having one for the nuns community up higher. Yeah. Well, that's where we think it's going to go right now. <laughs> it's like, yep, you know, a bit, bit more clearing to go on. So we're going to do Cora up there. Yeah. So anyway, say the mind of, of um, say that you practice this great virtuous generosity of making that offering and then later you regret it. And you, you know, sometimes people make a donation. I don't think to this place. I'm not talking about that. But I, I, I've got in my memory and then they wanted it back. Or maybe someone gives you something and they want it back. So that... That is a negative regret. You've done something positive and then you regret the positive action. Oh, I shouldn't have been nice to that person. They're never nice to me. That is maybe more like what we would do. Um, and so after the fact, you think, oh, well, they've not done anything for me. And we're just like, hang on a minute, which bit of this is within the body sat for vows and the body sat for path? I have to keep reminding myself. <laughs> okay, that one. And then the positive regret is this one, I've done something bad and then I've got to do something about it, taking some positive action in relation to a negative. So that's the positive regret. That's the one we're talking about here. Okay. So the power of regret. I think we're all familiar with that, with what we're doing with that. Interestingly enough, the Tibetans don't have a word for guilt. It's very handy, isn't it? It's like Japanese don't have a word for no. I think it's fantastic. I'm not sure. Maybe uh, I don't know when I would say ask advice from Geshe Sampton and he'd, he'd say not necessary. He never said no. Maybe it just wasn't in his vocabulary to say no. He always said not necessary, and I knew not necessarily meant perhaps don't do that. <laughs> Although I did one time ask Geshe to come and for an open day, come and give a talk, and he said not necessarily, and I actually I said Geshe, maybe not necessary for Geshe, but for the students very necessary, so he came. So I just had to give him the right um, reason, you know, strong request. Yeah, it's good learning. Okay. And then next one, the power of reliance. So this is what we were just talking about when we fall down on the ground. What is it we're relying on? So of course we're relying on our refuge, the objects of refuge, right? And then, you know, appealing you know, the guidance of our teacher, the guidance of the Buddha and so forth. Um, and then the other aspect of, of reliance or dependence is on sentient beings, you know, so reflecting on our kind, precious mothers, um, that really that's who give me the opportunity to purify because it's on the basis of them generally. I mean, we might, yes, we might break Samaya with in relation to the, to the guru, probably have, you know, in terms of not following the advice, um, or being disrespectful um, and so forth. I mean, we have those five actions of immediate retribution, which are what? Killing your mother or father. Killing your mother or father. Yeah, drawing, blood from the drawing blood from a Buddha, because you can't kill a Buddha, but drawing a blood from a Buddha with malicious intent. So it has to be like, like that um and killing yeah an aria being an aria so destined to become a buddha and divisive causing a schism amongst the sangha so so we may have you know 
not gone that far, but, you know, broken our samaya in relation to our gurus. But mostly when we generate, certainly when I'm looking at, you know, what are the things I need to purify today? <laughs> or hopefully nip it in the bud even sooner like a Tisha, but I'm not like a Tisha. <laughs> well, I'm trying to be like a Tisha, but long way to go. But as soon as the negative thought arises in your mind, I, it's towards sentient beings because they're the ones who push our buttons, especially the human variety seem to push our buttons more than the animal variety, it seems. I think, right? True. Just check up. Okay. So this reliance, this power of reliance, it's generally in relation to family, family, friends, probably more so in relation to them than strangers because we don't really have strangers on our radar. They're people we see about. They don't really affect me unless they cut across me in the traffic, you know, or occasionally something happens. But that's one I've worked on, you know, over years. And then, you know, the ones we dislike who, or who don't do what we want. So those ones probably a lot. Um, because they help us generate a huge altruistic compassion. And that's what we want to do because we want to help them. We want to become a Buddha. So we have to keep reminding ourselves of our vows, you know, oh, I've taken refuge in the Buddha, I've taken Bodhisattva vows and so forth. You know, turning to the guru as the guide, the Buddha as the guide, getting back on the path, getting back on track after falling down, back on the path, back on the spiritual path. You know, one of the prisoners who, um, when he went back into prison for the second time, Because the first time he'd been studying, discovering Buddhism and so forth, he got released. And when he went back into prison for the second time, he said, I, I strayed from the path. I thought stray doesn't even amount to <laughs> stray. Is... <laughs> anyway, it was good that he wrote, right? So, yeah, really strayed <laughs> big time. But that's the danger, it can happen to any of us any time. Mm -hmm. So we want to get back on the path, the direction we want to go. And that's why it's so important having each other as community to help each other out with that. Um, and even those who maybe don't have or any religious faith, religious tradition, we can just think about our ethics, you know, when we feel like I'm not living up, it, it's all about the ethics. I'm not living up to my own ethics, my own sense of myself, who I regard myself as being, you know. So just we can look at it at a conventional, ordinary level, but we can also look at it as, as you know, in relation to our spiritual path. So, but I think a, a lot of them is just like, oh, that doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel good to me. I've had yet another regrettable emotional episode. It's taken me an hour and a 20 minutes to say that. <laughs> it's pretty good, huh? <laughs> My favourite phrase. Purify. Okay. So relying on your personal values or so forth. Then the power of remedy is whatever practice we do, whether we're doing Vajrasafra, prostration, doje cadro, which when we do the Vajrasafra retreat here, which... We are doing at the end of the year. It's slightly reduced due to COVID-related catering challenges for the centre. And um, so we're not quite up to full strength, as you're well aware. But um, the fact that we're able to offer it is fantastic. So we'll see. You know, usually we have a doje cadro um, purification practice at the end of that where we... Um, where we have um, sesame seeds and make into the most monstrous scorpion-like thing that we can, ugly, which we just regard as all our afflictions. And then it's like we're offering all of that, you know, we do the rituals and offer all that to the mouth of Dorje Cadro, who, you know, it's a wonderful 
purification visualization very effective for venerable young children. so yep she feels the effects of that so it's a wonderful wonderful practice you know involving visualization mantra recitation and the offering of you know our reflections to be purified purify into emptiness which is the most powerful purification practice we can possibly do meditating on emptiness and again in all of these practices that little packages that they come in that we have Rinpoche puts again and again, you know, it's right there. Meditate on emptiness. Think this, think that. Tells you what to think, you know. That tells you the points of analysis, not just, you know, oh, meditate on emptiness, you know. Of course, you can do that when you're very familiar, but it's all laid out. It's wonderful. Okay, so the remedy is doing whatever. Okay, I've got to do something we've just said. I've got to get this poison out of my body. What do I do? Vajra Safra practice, prostration practice, Doje Kadro practice, whatever practice or any positive action to purify negative karma, right? So, for example, there was one nun I met when Rinpoche had given her a practice of, uh, I think it was 700,000 water bowl offerings because she'd been, before she ordained, had been working in a lab, research lab and been responsible for the killing of many many beings so she engaged in that as a purification practice um yeah and then another monk now monk he was in the um what's his name Garchen? uh i forget his actually monk name fred <laughs> in singapore who was high up in the army in singapore and so he um Every year, I don't know if he's still doing, but millions and millions of liberating of fish, you know. He's made a huge commitment to Rinpoche. I think there was a write-up in Mandala one time as well. But just liberating, you know, a lot of animal liberation, saving lives. So that can be another form, like when we're in Sydney, we did that. Um, we'd go to the market and buy up the mud crabs because somebody had researched the perfect environment, mangrove, um, what do we call them, mangrove swamp to release them into, um, until we, until which we never released the address of, just if people came along, we gave them the secret little map, you know, before GPS. And... Um, and people would go there until we got a letter from the Sydney Harbour Foreshore Authority, cease and desist, because we were destroying the ecological balance, which, of course, we weren't. <laughs> the people fishing over there might have been, but <laughs> we were putting back in the right spot and where we knew they'd survive and it was all, you know, right for them. Anyway, so many, many, when I was at Lama Zopa Rinpoche's house, and probably still going on there now in Aptos, of... Um, every 8th, 15th and 30th of the Tibetan month, animal liberation, getting the worms and so forth. Um, yeah. And we've had, at least in a couple of years ago, we had here the animal blessings and people brought up their dogs. But um, we discovered that Geshe doesn't like dogs, which doesn't mean don't bring them up. It just means maybe Geshe is not going to be doing the dogs. But did you see him with the rat? Yesterday, um, Geshe was asked to uh, uh, bless a rat, a little cute little white rat called Mani on Mani Padme Hong Mani. So that's one way, you know, give your, give your pets uh, Dharma names. So Venerable Wang Mo is um, putting all her um, bird uh, rehabilitation skills into action with little Bodhi, the fig, figlet, as we call it, the figlet, the fig bird, the fig bird, the fig bird, baby. So wonderful. Getting all those imprints. Okay. So this involves, you know, the remedy involves renewing our 
commitment, getting back on the path, right? <laughs> renewing our commitment, getting back on the path, and then engaging in um, whichever practice uh, we're going to be doing. And then I just want to finish the four opponent powers before we have a break. Um, oh, sorry, the power of remedy we're on, isn't it? Power of remedy, whatever action we're going to do. Power of resolve. So that's at the very, usually at the very end of the practice, um, really important, making a strong determination to not engage in that negative, non-virtual state of mind, action, unskillful speech or harmful speech or, or action again. And as we know, it's really, really hard to change old habits. So we really are chipping away, chipping away a little bit at the time. And so this is where we have to be realistic and set a realistic time frame for that. And as Lama Zopa Rinpoche says, that we've got to keep in mind, as Rinpoche says, we can mold our mind into whatever shape we want, you know, that we look at that when we've got the 12 links and the, you look at the... Um, karmic volition, you know, that one, the, the, that one there. And it's, it's a potter and making all shapes of pots. So we're creating moment by moment our pots, you know, so we can, we can mold shape our mind. It's fluid. It's not something solid. It's not something permanent. It's not unchanging. We can change. So there are probably ones that we have already, because we have engaged in this, these, some of these practices many times, particularly about your suffer, I think. And so that we can say, well, yeah, the harder ones that I can relinquish for the rest of my life, I've already done. Perhaps we might say that. But every, it seems every time, even we say, I can you know, make that commitment for this second or till the end of this practice or to the end of this session, or as I said to one of the prisoners, make that before you go to bed and then for however many hours you're asleep, you can count eight hours, 10 hours, however many hours, I'm not beating anyone up and I'm not bad mouthing anybody. And that was the most liberating thought for him to be able to think, oh, for that many hours, I'm not harming anyone because you're asleep. So all of this, and I think the more we do this practice, we see it does weaken those tendencies. Not as quickly as we'd like it to. And they pop back in just when we least expect it, isn't it? It's just like, oh, I didn't see that one coming in my mind. <laughs> Regrettable emotional episode. There's a question on Zoom, sorry. Uh, hi, Kate. Geshela mentioned confession on Thursday after the body sat for vows. What is the formal confession process? So we're going through that now. And then when we go through the prostrations, which we're going through next, we're looking at that in more detail. So Geshela might have, I can't remember um, what Geshela said about the formal confession process. So it might have been in the context of when we were talking as Sangha. So there's one process for Sangha called Sojong, and it happens like twice a month. When I say it happens twice a month, we don't have the requirements here in this place for it to happen twice a month, like the ritual of it to happen. But having um, had the opportunity to do that a few times, at various places where that, you know, you've got the right amount of sangha and somebody who knows it off by heart and da da da, the you know, etc. There's a few things you need. The first thing you need is four fully ordained. Five, that's right. I always think it's only four, but it's four plus one. Five fully ordained. So that makes it a little bit difficult. But Geshele suggested to us during the year that we could do it, well, he didn't say Clayton's, that's my interpretation, <laughs> a modified version um, together. So, but this is what for, for, um, for us and for all of us, we're going through now, Kate. This is a whole, and there are specific 
um, confession prayer. So we'll go through that. And of course, we also looked at it when we look at when we look at the seven limb prayer, the limb of confession. So it fits in there. So there's a few different spots, but we'll go in more detail after the break. Um, so we make this resolve. Being realistic. Because it's it, and if we do this on a daily basis, I, you know, you do that at the end of the day, you reflect back and where was I angry? Where do I owe an apology and so forth? And if if realistically nothing's come to mind, you go a whole day. Wow, that's amazing. And you rejoice in that and delight in that. That's fantastic. I'm not as angry as I thought I was. It works. It totally works. Okay. So there are our there are four um, opponent powers that for us to complete these hundred thousand prostrations, hundred thousand vajra suffers, you do that at each session. So refuge, bodhicitta, we've gone through that. We've gone through the four opponent powers. So now we're going to go through the specific um, purification practices. We'll see how, how, how much longer that takes. Um, so we'll have a break now. Confession to the guru in a face-to-face -face sense. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, yep, yep, yep. I, I, I see what you're saying. We'll talk more after the break. Can you ask you just to stay on? Can you stay? I just want to do the logistics about lunch tomorrow. Can you stay online, folks who are online? Because Leonie's got a few in, um, things she wants to discuss with you about logistics for tomorrow. And I think uh, Gompola is going to join us up here. Is Virginia online? She's yes, going to. She was online before. Yes, she's hoping to join us up here too tomorrow. So that's lovely. I'm just going to pause the um, recording. Please do.